Good morning. You're listening to Central Wisconsin's 24-hour information station, AM 1320 WFHR. It's time now for the Morning Magazine, brought to you by Comfort Air Heating, Cooling, Plumbing. Welcome, everybody, to Morning Magazine for the September 23rd, 2020. Your host, James J. Mayloff here. At 1030 today in Part 2, we are going to speak with Daniel Nystrom and Sarah Schuler from the ODC. Right now, we have in with us not only Wisconsin Rabbits Community Media, and a hello to Kev and all our friends over there, but we have Lance Plimo with us from Wood County Board Chairman, uh, Wood County Board Chairman, I should say. Lance, good morning. Good morning. Always good to be here. Yeah, I appreciate you being in. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Family? Uh, hope everybody it? else is too. Yeah, my family's good. I hope the community is as well. Mm, good to hear. Uh, Lance, uh, we always like to kind of be free form here and you, when you and I get together. Uh, hey, is anything been going on with the board recently that you'd want to touch on? Sure. Yeah, we're about as free form as you can get. Uh, <laughs> believe me, there's no conversation ahead of time as to where we're going to go or what we're going to talk about. Uh, you know, there's, there's a couple of things that, uh, you know, kind of come to mind right now. Uh, this is the time of year where we're really in the the heart of the budget, uh, you know, and all those issues start to come to the forefront as we look at how the end of this year is playing out and then, you know, bringing into focus where we're going to be next year. So most of what we're dealing with is, is budget related at this time. Yeah. And that segues perfectly into, you know, some of those things that you consider long run. Uh, one of the things that was just remarkable the other day is number of years back, we decided that we were going to bond for a lot of the capital improvement projects that we do in the county, specifically roads, because we realized the road conditions in the state were way worse than they should be. We were way behind. Uh, so we started a process through capital improvement to improve that greatly within Wood County. And we've done that. We've probably increased the condition of the roads, county roads, countywide by probably 30 to 40 percent in, mm. in quality. And those are called PACER ratings, actually, if you're doing highway stuff. Uh, but what was remarkable is we bond in the neighborhood of about $4 million a year, give or take a couple of dollars. And we just this year uh, had the bond sale. We borrowed that money, and this is unbelievable. If you're out there, you buy a house. We borrowed the money at 0.78%. Hmm. Not 7.8%, hmm. 0.78%. I guess which is a little concerning if you you know have money in CDs in the bank and stuff, that there's people out there thinking – for the next 10 years, interest rates are going to remain fairly low or you wouldn't be tying up, you know, your capital if you're the lender. Mm -hmm. uh, but it bodes really well for the county. That's going to be a huge savings going forward uh, as we look at that interest rate. So we look at that. And then the other big issue uh, that will be coming up is, you know, do we construct a new jail? And if we do, how do we do it? Uh, exactly where do we do it on the property that we own downtown? What will that cost be? And then, you know, how would that affect the taxpayer? And that's a million moving parts. Yeah. And, and I, you know, that's one of those ones I appreciate you bringing it up because it's one of those ones I wouldn't want to put you on the spot with necessarily because, like you said, there's a lot of moving parts and there's certainly nothing that's been decided or or anything. Everything is kind of in, in conversation mode right now. But you brought up right there in that, in that brief sentence uh, four or five really interesting things about this if the jail is to come. Um, just looking at it in general. Let's say that it, there is going to be one bill. Let's say just for you know argument's sake or whatever you want to word it, and where we would put it, I think, is a great uh, kind of not uh, conversation to have necessarily, but really an interesting kind of debate uh, almost of, of where you would put this if you tear the one, old one down, build a new one, all these things, because we're not talking about a normal like shopping mall or anything. We have prisoners. We have uh, people that are already in the jail and stuff. And you would you have to be able to put them somewhere if you're going to do something like that. There's a lot of moving parts, as you mentioned, literally um, with this. You've talked to the sheriff or some other people because you're you're asking questions that that are the same that we ponder every day. And and that's a consideration. We did a jail study a number of years ago. And at that point in time, decided the best place to do that is located in the area of vicinity or attached to the courthouse. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is you have the courts there and all of the other ancillary services, uh, and you're trying to do this as cost-effectively as possible. Uh, I'm going to go back a little bit. You know, there were a number of people said, well, we wouldn't be dealing this if we would have done this in the late 90s. Mm. And I'm saying, well, we have a jail right now that's roughly 40 years old, and it's obsolete in its construction layout and some of the things that the state uh, government wants to see as far as uh, – you know, inmate observation, the way we handle that, uh, you know, the way we keep track of those people. Well, if you think about that, had we done that in the 90s, you'd be 25 years, you know, into the process looking at a new jail again. And in the meantime, we saved 20 million or 25 mm -hmm. million dollars. So we are looking at that. And, you know, one of the considerations, the first were 
to you know basically build it out across Avon Street uh, towards the old Red Owl building there uh, and do that. But that requires moving a lot of utilities. Now, n- take nothing I say as concrete plans. Right. This is what we're, we're just do. talking. In yeah. fact, I made the I made the comment the other day. You know, I always hope to hear from the public because any idea I get later that's better. Uh, you know, we always consider. Sure. And then all of a sudden, uh, after we kind of looked at where we might go, somebody said, maybe building right on site would be better. Hmm. Less property acquisition, less disruption in neighborhoods. Uh, and then the first question is, can we do it? Hmm. Uh, the answer is yes. Can we do it cost effectively? Don't know. Hmm. Uh, and then the big question, what do you do with the people you currently have incarcerated while you do that? Or can you do it in stages? Um, yeah, I guess, you know, my personal feeling would be if you could do it where you have it right now and you don't uh, interrupt the lifestyle of the people around the jail, you know, their homes uh, where they've been, and you can build what you need to build, that might be the best option. But that comes back to if you build. You know, you're looking at a price tag of roughly $50 million. And if I surveyed the people out there and said, where would you like to spend $50 million this year? I would bet that jails would be pretty close to the bottom of the list. Mm. Uh But when you sit in the seat that our county board supervisors do uh, or those other government officials, you realize it's something that that you have to have and it has to be compliant with today's rules, regulations, laws, statutes. So something is going to probably have to be done. Yeah, uh, that's and that's kind of where I was going to go, Lance, is that if we don't do something in the next year or two, certainly in the next five to 10 years, something's going to have to be done with it uh, eventually. Um, it, it's just one of those things. We, you certainly don't want to keep kicking the can down the road and, and just expect the next generation to do it or what have you. But at the same time, like you said, you got you got a pie here that you got to decide what you want to put. If you just give everybody 50 million that they can put wherever they want. You're right. Most people are probably not going to choose that as number one on their survey. I will. I, I do think, and you know this better than I do, because uh, you've talked with the same people I have and everything about this issue. Uh, it is something where we do have to consider the safety of of our not only our inmates, but certainly, of course, the people working there, our sheriff's department, our police department, all these people who are interacting with these. Uh, that, that's just as important as anything else, and their safety and and knowing that they're okay. They're not only okay, but they're able to do their job to the fullest. Yeah, there's a lot more cost to uh, the jail than just the physical structure and, and the cost of incarceration in those prisoners. Mm-hmm. I mean, th- there is the the cost involved in recruitment and retention of, of yeah. jail personnel, of their physical well-being as well as their mental well-being. You know, you need their safety taken into concern, the ability to move people in and out of courtrooms mm-hmm. safely. Um, you know, right now, those uh, those people, as they attend court, typically go through the hallways of the courthouse. You know, how do we get them into court uh, more secur- securely and in a better fashion? Um, you know, the, the thing that we're thinking about in the background, the one that always concerns me is uh, I attended a meeting with the governor and the secretary of the Department of Corrections about probably s- several months ago. And he made the statement at the time, the governor, that they want to reduce the jail population in the state by about 40 hmm. percent. Actually, he said the prison population. OK, I was going to say the prison say, population yeah, comes down 40 percent, I think conversely, the jail population comes down because sure. there's either going to be a, a change in laws, a change in sentencing, or there's going to be a really big number of vacancies in state prisons hmm. where we might otherwise be able to house inmates that we have in for a longer duration, those ones that are maybe in six to 12 months Mm. uh, instead of the real short-term ones. So you take that all into consideration. And then, you know, as it's not, you know, it's not a joke because it's a serious thing. But, you know, if I talk to the surrounding county board chairs and their boards, uh, you know, the conversation always becomes who's going to flinch first and build the jail Mm. because we will use your capacity. Uh, A full hotel is more efficient than one that is 20, 30, 40 percent occupied. Mm. You want to build enough for future consideration. We used to have, you know, 100 inmates. And then over the time, it went up to about 170. And it stayed pretty constant for a number of years. And all of a sudden, we're at 250. Mm. And you go, well, I'm not sure what the reason for that is. And then will it change again? The last thing I want to do is build something with a capacity of 300 inmates. And then all of a sudden, only have 90. Right, right. Uh, which you know, causes some sleepless nights. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, I, I can't imagine. Can't even, can't even begin to imagine. Um, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, but had I known that I could bond, now you're talking a bigger number and bigger risk, at less than 1%. Mm-hmm. In other words, it basically costs me nothing other than the cost of the project. There's, there's, no, you know, there's no cost from an interest standpoint. 
that would have been a good time to do it. Yeah, yeah so, that would have been nice uh, to and, and I think it's going to probably stay that way for a couple of years. So uh, if something is going to be done, and I think the need has been somewhat ascertained, this might be the time to do it. But then again, those numbers have to fit into a whole bigger picture. Yeah. And uh, that's the puzzle we try to put together every day. Is there another part of this, and not even just with building a jail, but really with any kind of like uh, construction going on in the area, especially major construction, is there a, a positive economic end to this too, where we talk about that 50 mil that might come out of the pie, but also the, the jobs it might create or the, you know, the, the business it might give to a certain company or that kind of thing? In the short term, certainly. I mean, anytime right. you have construction, I happen to, you know, right now it looks as though the solar project is going to be built down in Saratoga. And I happen to drive by, I was going into Madison the other day where they're doing a solar project, and it looks like they're doing about a 40 or 50 acre project. And there had to be 100 construction vehicles and workers on site. Mm-hmm. And that that's a tremendous short term benefit, uh, as well as the long term benefit from uh, the fees that we collect from those entities when they're finished. Uh, construction of a jail certainly helps. Uh, it helps if you have local contractors. One of the things that you run into, and, and a lot of the subs end up being local, is there are not a lot of companies that build jails. You know, it's a pretty unique yeah, market. Yeah. Uh, so typically, the general contractor on those types of projects are people who have done these elsewhere. And that usually is, involves somebody out of city, it, out of state. Usually, yeah. yeah. You know, so and kind of like get away said, from what we're hoping there. With yeah, that. nothing. You know, and nothing's been decided. And so, you know, I guess if I was just talking to the public in a general forum somewhere, if we were in regular times, we were out in a group, I'd say. Nothing's been decided but for sure. Uh, the need has been ascertained, but there are things that, you know, you at home, I bet, need. Every one of you out there. You know, you need a new car. Uh, you need a new refrigerator. It's not working quite as well as you'd like, but you can't, uh, you know, because of financial considerations or other places that resources have to be allocated. And, and I always tell people, you know, before you put new carpeting in your house, you better fix the hole in the roof. And so we, we need to look at those uh, needs that we currently have, and those might be uh, at Edgewater, you know, where we care for an elderly population. It might be up at, you know, what everybody, re- it was Norwood. It's mm-hmm. now referred to as our Northwood County Health Annex, but, mm-hmm. you know, everybody knows it as Norwood uh, at those facilities, at, at our current courthouse facility. And then as we look for deals, you know, a number of years ago, we were looking at 35 to 40 million to add on to the courthouse. Mm-hmm. And we, by procuring the old, the River Block property that was consolidated papers, you know, we saved $35 million. Mm-hmm. Uh, in that process. So we always look at alternatives, where we can go and how do we do it. When uh, the election first came up for uh, mayor uh, in Rapids, uh, it was when I first started hearing people talk about the budget and worrying about the, the city as a whole uh, being you know, in debt and things like that. And I hadn't really heard much from people about that, to be honest with you. When it came to talking to board members or the mayor himself, uh, whether it was at the time or the new one, the, some of the main topics were, that came up are ones that you've heard your whole lives out here, you and Kevin, the trains or, or things that, yeah. like that. Then all of a sudden I started hearing more and more about the budget and more about that kind of thing. Is for you and your position, is that kind of the overall thing that you've heard from the public most concern about or, or most uh, that they want attention to? Yeah, I mean, that that plays into everything. Right. Uh, and it's it's really interesting. And, you know, we talk about bonding, mm. you know, to get, to get projects started, uh, the cost of borrowing money, whether it's, you know, the county or you at home. Uh, those are all considerations. And, you know, when you can do it, when you can leverage credit effectively, it makes sense. I mean... It, for instance, if you have a mortgage on your home at, now I'm talking real estate, which I do, but I mean, if you can get a mortgage on your home at 3%, even if you have $100,000 in the bank, or maybe not the banks, maybe a bad example, but you know, in a brokerage account, mm. if you're making 10%, you're not going to take that money out at 10% when you can borrow money at 3%. Right. Now you want to have the safety net there and know you can do it. So what's really interesting from the county's perspective is everybody has a, a debt ceiling or a debt limit capacity. Um, and some of the cities, uh, local municipalities are bumped right up against that limit and they, they play against that every year. Uh, our county doesn't use one tenth of the capacity. Hmm. So we've been extremely fiscally responsible over the years, but then you use that capacity when you have an emergent need. So that comes into play where you say, I'll have occasionally some constituents say, well, why don't you, why didn't you save $50 million and put it away in a rainy day fund? Hmm. Well, I think you're better off keeping that money in your pocket and spending it as you need rather than have the county build some huge reserve over here, hoping that someday they may use it. And then you need to rely on those elected officials to make those good decisions when it needs to occur 
at, you know, at the most advantageous rate available. Does a decision like that or a thought like that uh, come st- change with the, the Verso situation and that kind of thing? You know, th- that is in the back of my mind every day. Yeah, yeah. Um, how is that going to impact the entire community? Uh, you know, you certainly have an awful lot of people who have lost jobs or looking for other employment. You know, I, I'm knocking on wood here every day, hoping that somebody comes in, uh, finds that facility valuable. And, and and I really think that probably will happen at some point. I don't know that it's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, but if that occurs, that puts us on a, a better path. But uh, as things, you know, as the effects trickle down from that, it's certainly going to trickle into the housing market, into property taxes, the ability to pay their property taxes, uh, the amount of consumption, because the big part of our county uh, discretionary budget relies on sales tax revenue, uh, which surprisingly, I want to applaud everybody out there, our sales tax revenues in Wood County, we projected those to be way off early in March when we heard what was coming. And and we really are right on target right now mm. uh, based on budgets. So that's noteworthy. So that's been, yeah, that's been unbelievable. But that one yeah, that's a huge component in the back of my mind, at least when we make these decisions. And, and, and I appreciate the, uh, the the transparency on that because you know, it, like I, I like to mention with anybody in any position, whether they're in a uh, that, whether they're with our police department or they are a board member or a, a representative, you're citizens first and foremost. You're citizens, and, and you guys are going under the same laws and dealing with the same things that we are. It's not like the weather's different for you than it is for me. It's it's the same and. We need to kind of remind, be reminded of that sometimes, I think. So you're certainly, any of these decisions coming up with you and the board, a lot of that has got to play into your minds as far as what you were saying about not, you know, that rainy day fund sounds nice and everything, but right now with the, especially the current environment, it's probably better for you to have that money and, and do what it, what you're going to do with it. Yeah, you know, one of the discussions we always have at the state level is, is property taxes as a whole. It's probably the most regressive tax you can have. Mm -hmm. Uh, And in what rate of sales tax would you have to have to offset that? And, you know, one of the things I always hear, and I kind of chuckle when I hear it, is um, everybody needs to pay their fair share. And I'm going, well, I wish somebody would actually define for me what fair share is. Mm -hmm. And then I always hear them say, and the wealthy should pay their fair share. And I go, well, define that for me uh, as well. You know, somebody's definition of wealthy is they can go to the store and, by groceries and other right. people is, you know, 10 million isn't quite there yet. So, I, I you know, a definition would help. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, with this uh, with this plant closure right now and the jobs that have been lost, that's a huge part of the population of Wisconsin Rapids. And if you haven't been directly affected, you probably have a neighbor, a relative or a friend who has. And, you know, once you buy your house and you look at property tax rates and those are something due every year or, or they're at some point government has the ability to step in or your lender um, and take those properties. So, yeah, that's a consideration. So, you know, one of the things we look at at the state is how do we replace that revenue we would lose through a reduction in property tax with a tax that might be more fair? And when you look at uh, consumption taxes, a sales tax, for instance, who pays more? Those who are, if, def, I don't want to define that, wealthy. I mean, right. <laughs> a little different if I'm rampant, but if I'm buying a yacht, I'm paying more property taxes than, or more sales tax than I am if I go out and buy clothes right. uh, for the kids or, or something, you know, small toy. So it tends to go that way. And, and it's a direction I think we need to move because it, property taxes as a long-term solution are not the best way to do this. Uh, when it comes to making that happen or, or getting more to that, is that something that you, the board, are, are, are kind of working with or thinking and uh, doing or trying to do, I should say? Well, yeah. You know, locally, we can't make that change. Right. But, um, you know, in my I'll put my other hat on as the president of the counties association. Uh, this is something we talk about in Madison all the time with our legislators. Hmm. How do we replace that? How do we get smarter? You know, we, personal property tax is a great one. We had some people that had, you know, per, they get a personal property tax bill of 99 cents. And I'm thinking, how much did it cost them to process that bill, to put it in an envelope, to send it out to you, to have you write a check, put it in the mail, and put a stamp on it? That's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, personal property taxes, to, to a great extent, have gone away. Um, and then at the state levels, how do you replace that revenue? Because you still have to provide services. So those discussions happen every day. And uh, those, <laughs> those are the ones. There's the easy one we always kid about. You know, somebody calls me up and says, geez, Lance, there's a big pothole in the middle of County Highway H. Mm. Well, call the highway commissioner. They send a truck out. We fill it up. Those are simple. Yeah. It's where do you allocate those dollars? You know, do you, do you use it to build a jail? Do you use it to firm up uh, mental health services in the county? 
or diversion programs uh, for you know those incarcerated or inmates, or do you use it uh, for veterans programs? You know, it, that's the tough part. Yeah, uh, there's only so much of the pie and, and, and deciding where these things go. It's part of the reason why you're in there, but it's also part of the reason why we're thankful people like yourself are in there because I'm sure Kev can notice this as well, too. Uh, I love when we get on a topic that you get really animated about. But I, I can tell how passionate, but this is, it's important for us to see those kind of things and know because we don't want somebody in that position necessarily like, well, Stephen Wright or somebody where it's monotone and not really, I want to see that passion. I want to see that in our representatives and our people that are in these positions because that's what we need nowadays. We need we need people that care. Well, yeah, and you know, let's say jails is a really good example. If somebody says, "Well, the construction cost is high." It is, but can there be uh, can there be a reduction in labor cost or, or labor per prisoner if you have a better system? Um, like I said, the retention, the recruitment cost, those things play in. Uh, we do ship, you know, a number of our invitees, you know, right, right. out of county. But I hear people say, "Well, that cost us." you know, $48 a day. Well, it's, it's really $48 minus whatever it costs us to keep them here. Yeah. And then you weigh that against staffing costs, personnel costs, health insurance, all of those things. And so it isn't a simple, you know, here's a number, you spend it or you don't. I mean, there's a lot of things that come into play as you look at that. And then at the end of the day, you say, is that more cost effective? Yeah. So when we look at things like, you know, sales tax revenue, which looks good, um, I'll segue right for you, right this way for you is, you know, I look at parks. Our parks are having a tremendous year because uh, all of those things that you usually attended around the state have been canceled to the greatest extent. The summer fest, the state fairs, the county fairs. I was curious about this. So, yeah. Hmm. So, I mean, our county park revenues, is, as far as camping hmm. and stuff, is way up. Hmm. And and I'm hoping that's a precursor of what will occur in the future. You know, they see how nice it is, yeah. what yeah. facilities we have. And, by the way, just in case anybody's asking out there, they don't have to call, our, our campgrounds are open hmm. until October 31st. Uh, at Southwood and Northwood County Parks. And then our Dexterville Park, we keep that open through hunting season because we have a lot of hunters that pull uh, units in out there through the hunting season. But uh, those revenues have been fantastic this year, uh, mm. which provides some opportunity. So, uh, you know, there's been a lot of things to deal with this year as far as the the COVID situation. And, and conversations typically get driven that direction almost exclusively as we try to work our way through it. But there's also, I think, been some benefit on the other side is is people seeing what their community has to offer. And you and I, James, talk about this all the time. It drives me nuts when I hear somebody say, eh, there's nothing to do here. Yeah. If I made a list every day, there's no way in the world I could get through what there is to do even on a daily basis. No. Um, yeah, I mean, yes, I cannot go to a Brewers game in Wisconsin Rapids, but I can go to a Rafters game. Right. And, and when you think about it, even if you live in the city, and I grew up in the Chicago area, how many Cubs games did I actually go right, to a year? Yeah. Yeah, it's such uh, a good a point. Yeah. And and so if I had to drive to Milwaukee for that event, you know, that's great and you and I hopefully do it. Um it's not that far to Green Bay if you want to go to a Packers game. I don't need to live in Green Bay to go to a Packers. Our location is one of the biggest selling points, I would think, of this area. It is, and we're seeing people locate to this area rather rapidly based on public safety, which is something we talk about. Yeah. You know, they're calling it a you know basically a flight from congestion, but I, I hear hear often a flight from fright. Uh, you know, when we survey people, the number one consideration is public safety. When I walk out my door, I want to be safe. Our sheriff's done a great job, our district attorney's office, uh, the community as a whole in, in kind of self-policing. So uh, that's going to be beneficial to us in the long term. Yeah. Uh, Lance, uh, not only do I uh, appreciate the transparency and always just having that free form uh, conversation with you, I love that half the questions when I'm about to ask them, you ask yourself. You, you get it out of the way. I don't, I don't have to do half the job, Kev. I don't really. Yeah, I, I just probably sit here talk and, too much and should let you. you <laughs> this is your time. You talk. I, if anything, I talk too much. I just appreciate that part of you because it, it shows, again, what uh, one of the overall points I like to get out there is that you you're thinking of these things too. And as much as you're taking feedback from the community, you're taking it in. You're hearing it. It's not just listening. It's hearing it and doing something with that information and those questions. I can tell that you're, you think about these things and other board members do. Appreciate the time and, and appreciate what you're doing for the community. Well, you know, I'm passionate about it. I think every single person out there who's probably run for office, you know, whether it be at the town level, the county, the state level, is, is passionate. And the one thing we really do, or, or at least that I do, is I try to answer every single person that calls me. Uh, I do know that typically I have more information on the subject than they might have. But in any specific issue, um, I learn from the public every day. And, and that's why I said, you know, right now, as, as we drill down with information, if we ever get to build in a jail, every now and then somebody calls me from the public and says, have you thought about? 
And I always tell people, you know, there's two things that I love in a meeting. It's the person who asks the question I can't answer, and I have to do some research because that means they're going down a path I haven't even thought about. And then my favorite one is the person who asks the question that I didn't even think could possibly be a question hmm. uh, because it means they're going in a, another direction and they're thinking about this. You know, I always hate to hear outside the box, inside the box, but, you know, just a different mindset. And, and that's greatly appreciated. So I encourage those people to call, to share those ideas, you know, get on the phone, shoot me an email. If people want to do that, how can they reach you? Uh, my, number's in the, my number's in the phone book. Um, you know, it's 421-4001, but it's in the phone book. Uh, so, I mean, anybody can call me. They can go to the Wood County website. They can email. They can text me. You know, I, I'm always willing to talk about anything. Appreciate that and appreciate the time, Lance. We'll talk again real soon. Thanks, James. Always appreciate it. A big thank you to Lance Plimlow, the Wood County Board Chairman, and a big thank you to our friends over at Wisconsin Rapids Community Media for being with us. We were going to take a break, come back with our friends from the ODC right here on Morning Magazine, AM 1320 WFHR.